Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go back in history and I'll start with 2018 where there was a massive street protest in Bangladesh uh, on this day in 2018, 20, 29th of July 2018, over road safety. It was a series of public protests in Bangladesh advocating improved road safety uh, and it held from the 29th of July to the 8th of August in 2018. They were sparked really by the deaths of two high school students in Dakar struck by a bus operated by an unlicensed driver who was racing to collect passengers. The incident impelled students to demand safer roads and stricter traffic laws and the demonstrations rapidly spread throughout Bangladesh. The government arrested several protesters and a photographer for giving an interview about the protest to international media. And of course, uh, there continued to be a crackdown on student protesters, uh, which received high criticism, both domestically and internationally. Um, hundreds of students poured into the streets, demanding justice for the incident. And it was later revealed that three bosses were involved in the accident. All three drivers were arrested, along with two assistants. The Bangladesh police at that time filed 34 cases against protesters and arrested at least 37 of them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to you know, move from you know, this Bangladesh and down here to Nigeria and you know, also point out you know, some of the things that they were complaining about in 2018, I, I, I believe, are things that we also should complain about here. And that is proper systems and uh, proper you know, checks. Uh, with regards who we allow to drive. How many Nigerians really go through a driving test before they get a driver's license? Um, how many Nigerians really understand traffic laws? Drive around Lagos this morning, uh, you get to a red light, and you know some drivers even make you feel foolish for stopping at a red light, uh, the way that they drive through it and not even care that the, the traffic light is you know, red or says stop. Um, and so, you know, I, I believe that there are some things that we need to. It may not be the biggest challenge in Nigeria today. Um, in the news this morning, remember I shared that a couple of uh, youth corps members, you know, died on their way to camp um, in road accidents. Uh, last week, we also shared, you know, about dozens who also passed um, on in road accidents in certain parts of Nigeria. Um, there needs to be better, and it's not because accidents don't happen in developed countries. Yes, they do, but I believe that there need to be better um, institutions and systems to reduce, you know, the the possibility of a road crash. Um, better licensing for drivers, better, you know, car and road worthiness, um, and also better roads themselves. Uh, the amount of gallops and you know potholes and the likes that you see on Nigerian roads today sometimes, you know, lead to accidents. Um, and, you know, we don't need to wait for a protest before, you know, we take action and do what is right and what is necessary. Um, this also is a, is a good time to point out that what triggers protests sometimes, you know, cannot be predicted. The things that can lead to a massive, massive nationwide protest sometimes cannot be predicted. Same thing with the NSARS protest. It had been building up for a bit. The frustration had been building up. Um, uh, but... You know, not very many people expected that, you know, it was the incident in Delta State that would eventually lead to the nationwide protest. Um, and so, same thing with Bangladesh. It was this particular accident that happened um, that, of course, led to the nationwide protest or students' protest in Bangladesh uh, for better road safety laws and road safety um, regulations. Um, you can never tell when, you know, it will happen. But it doesn't mean, you know, that there is no anger building here and there you know, with different, you know, regards. Sometimes it might be with regards to healthcare, it might be with aviation, it might be with infrastructure, it might be with insecurity. There's anger building in certain corners. And you can never just tell which one would be, you know, the particular incident that will, you know, spark the flame. That's for Bangladesh. Now let's come down here to Nigeria. In 1966, if you um, have, of course, studied Nigeria's history with coups, then you would know this day, 29th of July, 1966. It is called the day that, of course, the counter-coup occurred. Um, sometime also in 1966, on the 15th of January, there was the first coup which took place, uh, and of course, uh, which uh, was uh, started by Chukuma Kaduna Nzogo, as it's popularly called, um, led to the death of Nigeria's Prime Minister at the time, Tafawa Belawan, and uh, 21 others. Um, Agui Ironsi eventually took over, you know, um, uh, government um, after the first coup in 19, in, uh, on the 15th of January 1966. 
This led to the coup being tagged and being seen as an Igbo coup, mostly because, according to the way that the story is told, there's a lot of people who would say, absolutely not. But, you know, according to the way the story is told, you know, it seems like it was an Igbo coup because, of course, Ago Yeronsi took over and uh, the number of uh, officers that were killed, allegedly, were from the north, including the prime minister. Um, this continued until this day, July 29th in 1966, when the counter coup took place. And this, of course, was led by Murtala Mohammed. Um, led to the death, death of um, you know, Agui, Ronsi, and Fajui, who were both in Ibadan at that time. I've read the story. It's a very interesting story of how they were accosted and you know, uh, dragged out of the house, taken to, uh, according to some of the stories that I read, taken to a forest, and they, or a bush rather, and they just never made it back um, you know, home alive. Um, but there's some important aspects of this you know, that I thought it would be interesting to share, and that is some other people who were part of this counter coup. I earlier mentioned Murtala Mohammed. Uh, was the one who led the coup. Uh, but there was also uh, Theophilus Danjuma. I'm going to quickly share. He was a major Theophilus Danjuma at that time. He was the principal staff officer, army headquarters in Lagos. There was also Major Abakiari, artill artillery in Kaduna. Um, other names that you might find interesting, Lieutenant Muhammadu Buhari <laughs> from the 2nd Brigade in Lagos. There's also... Um, What's his name now? I'm going to quickly share that name. Is there's oh yeah, there's also second lieutenant Sani Abacha, who was also a part of the counter coup, and there's also Ibrahim Babangida. I'm trying to find where his name was written. Yes, he's also a lieutenant of the first reconnaissance squadron in Kaduna. Um, Ibrahim Babangida, Babangida. I thought those names were pretty interesting to share, as uh, you know, some of the people who carried out the counter coup in 1966 that eventually led to the death of uh, Agui Ronsi and Faji and a couple of others. Um, and so uh, when people, of course, talk about the, the, you know, the persons who have been, you know, somehow, some way um, in Nigeria's political and governance, you know, space for many, many years, for decades, these names always come up, either because of their involvement in one thing or the other, or because of their, you know, position in, you know, Asorok, or because you were, they were military administrators at some point. But there are certain names that always come up. The Danjumas, the Sanya Bachas, the Babangidas, the Buharis, and sometimes the Old Shigong Basinjos, you know, always just show up here and there um, because of their roles in, um, you know, where Nigeria currently is today and, you know, and shaping Nigeria's history. You know, sometimes, you know, because of actions that they believed were the right things to do, sometimes out of their own selfish interest, sometimes maybe just because, well, it had to happen. Um, but they and these names will forever be in Nigeria's history because of certain roles that they, you know, played and certain, you know, parts uh, that they played, um, you know, at some time um, or the other. And I'm going back now, rather than what I'm talking about now is as far back as 1966, the Biafran War started. A year later, uh, 1967, and of course, last said till uh, uh, 69 or 70? 69, I believe. Um, 70, I beg your pardon. Um, so, yes, today in history, 1966, and that is the counter coup led by uh, Martella Mohammed and uh, Theophilus Danjuma, who, of course, were not generals at that time. Uh, Lieutenant Sania Bacha, Le uh, Lieutenant, um, uh, the um, what's his name now, Mohamed Buhari, and of course, uh, Ibrahim Babangida, where some of the other people. There was all the others, others uh, that were also part of it, but these were the major names that I thought to mention. Our next conversation this morning, our major conversation, is uh, on the agitations for self-determination. We're going to be speaking with a senior advocate of Nigeria, Paul Ananaba. Uh, who will be joining us to share his thoughts on what Nigeria currently is dealing with with regards to calls for self-determination in the southeast and, you know, the southwest also and in other um, uh, aspects. Um, so we're getting into that right after the short break here on The Breakfast. Stay with us. Good morning once again. <music> 